Welcome to our newest member. Let's poke in a we're gonna count. <laughs> it's an extra added one. All right, let's get started at the same place we always do. Ready? For the word of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. That is Hebrews 4:12. 2 Timothy 3:16 tells us. That all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Amen. All right. Last week, uh, we started a series, you know, on getting spiritually fit. We talked about, uh, we talked about we would need that for the days that are coming. And we really need to be spiritual, spiritually fit uh, in ourselves and, and feel really good about it. We, we put up a verse, it is Ephesians 6, 12. It says, for our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. In, in heavenly places. We talked about who this verse points at and, and tried to develop an understanding of, of who that foe really is. Because a lot of times when we read this verse, we aren't really thinking about it the way it is. But we needed, we needed to understand exactly who it was we're facing. So we, we looked at it and tried to understand what we have to do and how we can combat these forces. Paul is very clear when he is writing, at the very beginning of Ephesians, he addresses this letter. So we don't have to think about who it, who he's, who's he talking to, who's this fight with, because he addresses it to the saints and to those who are faithful to Christ Jesus. That, that verse applied to them then, and it applies to us now. So this is talking to us, and this is something that we need to be aware of. So how how do we do that? How do we how do we how do we fight this fight? How do we win this battle? Some of the translations say we wrestle against using a you know, Greek wrestling term. We wrestle against these things. How do we how do we do that? Well. We have to know our enemy. We talked about that, right? We have to know who the enemy is. Satan isn't any common foe. His forces are not any common foe. But luckily for us, we serve an uncommon God. Amen? Amen. All right, so last week I promised that we would go over some of the things that Satan and his little minions, what they can do and what they can't do. And so we're going to do that today. When it comes to believers, it's, it's not 100% clear in Scripture that Satan has to go and run to God and get permission for everything he does. It's not 100% it's not clear exactly how that works. So we don't know that every single time he has to run and go, hey, can I harass David? We, we don't know for sure exactly how that works in Scripture. I'm going to tell you some things that, that I think, and I think Scripture does really give us a pretty good idea of how that works. So, Scripture does say this. It says that there are boundaries that Satan must ask to go beyond. There are boundaries that he has to ask to go beyond. God is the authority of boundaries. We read in Job 3, or 38, 11, that God says this of the ocean. Okay? This far you will come, but no farther. And here your proud ways will be stopped. God sets the boundaries in his creation. There is nothing that he has not set the boundaries of. The boundaries of the sea, the boundaries of the land, the boundaries of rivers, all of those things are God's. And he also sets boundaries in the spiritual. So what about people? How does that work? Then this is, this is Job, and this is when Satan goes, presents himself with the sons of God before God says, what have you been doing? You know, walking around, checking things out. Okay, so then he comes in and says, then the adversary, that's not a correct, that's not an exact, you know, scriptural uh, quote there. <laughs> it's a, just kind of kind of my own uh, my own uh, way of saying it. So then the adversary answered the Lord saying, has Job feared God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him and, and around his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. One of my favorite Christian comedians, Tim Hawkins. I love this guy. Joe. 
Can we do a little better than a hedge for protection? <laughs> A hedge? You know, you just talk about little animals getting through and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty funny. Listen, if you, but if you read the Old Testament, you're going to know that in that time, back then when this was written, the things that people had to deal with, okay, they were scared of gophers. All right? They were afraid of lions and bears and leopards and hyenas. And those were all of the things that God, God's Word tells us those were things that people worried about back then. So see, a stone wall in those cases really wasn't as effective as a hedge of thorns. And they, would, they, would, they would grow these hedges of thorns around their property to protect their property. Okay, because I mean, if a leopard could go, oh, he could go right over a wall, a rock wall. That's not a problem. You know, I don't know. Any of y'all have, have ever had a run-in with a Costa Rican lemon steel hedge? <laughs> <laughs> Right, these things will stop mad gals. I mean, in fact, if you will look, that is that is the material with which our replication, uh, you know, crown of thorns is made. This is lemon seal stones, and and pretty much every single time that I have to trim these in my yard, I come back wounded. Okay? Yeah. So hedges are effective. I don't want anybody to think that God's idea of protection, or even as Satan was telling him, you put a hedge tech of protection around Job. That was a good thing. That was not a bad thing. Uh, what we do know, though, is that when Satan came and asked, made this little statement, God said, okay, I'll move the boundaries. I will change the boundaries. And you can do this and this and this, so I'm going to reset the boundaries for you to test Job's faith, and I'll put them right here. They were here, but I'm going to put them right here. So do your best within the boundaries that I have set, the reset boundaries, all right? Then the Lord said, Simon, Simon, listen, Satan has demanded to have you, to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you have Repented, strengthen your brothers. Here in the New Testament, we see this again. Satan had to ask to go beyond the boundaries that God has set. Okay? He couldn't just go start messing. Oh, and by the way, the you here in the Greek is plural. So he wasn't just asking to sift Peter, he was asking to sift all of them. Okay? Plural you, so like everybody, he was specifically speaking to Peter for a reason. But he was talking about every single one of the apostles. He was after them all. And he asked permission to break them. That's what this says. He wanted to break them. Let me ask, let me say that again. In case somebody wasn't here, they were not, not listening. Satan had to ask permission of God to break the apostles. Now, when we look at what happened after this, we see that Peter failed the test of faith. In fact, all of them failed the test of faith. God moved the boundaries because Satan asked. So what do we make of that? What do we make of the fact that the tests were failed? That the apostles, you know, I mean, listen, God knew it before they blew it. Right? <laughs> it's not a surprise. He knew exactly what was going on. But why did God let them fail? Let them fail because he knew that they would ultimately be strengthened by failing the test. I mean, it says, and when you have repented, strengthen your brothers because y'all are going to be feeling really low about failing the test. So strengthen them to understand what it is I'm saying here. Okay, this is for their benefit. It was in their best interest that they failed the test because it made them stronger. This will happen. It's going to happen to you. It's going to happen to me. It's going to happen sometimes. We're going to fail the test. But we want to always have to recognize when we fail the test, that God didn't fail us in protecting us. He did not fail in the protection. We may have failed the test miserably, but God never fails in the protection. He's teaching us. He's making us stronger. He is allowing us to go through a circumstance 
so that we can empathize with our Christian brothers and sisters and say, you know, I, did, I understand that happened to me. Have y'all ever had that experience when somebody was way down and you know, that same thing happened to me? I didn't realize what it was for, but right now, standing right here before you, God has shown me right now, this is my thing. This is my divine appointment right now to share my failure and that God was always sovereign. Listen, Satan can test us within the boundaries that God has set. Those that he has laid out, Satan can test us within those. He can also ask permission to go before God. He goes before God and says, okay, can I, can I give him a little extra jab? Can I do that? Can I go beyond the boundaries? And if God so chooses, he can change the boundaries. He can move the mark. But Satan cannot do anything that God doesn't allow. Period. We know that everything that Satan can do, everything that Satan can do, and can't do, is up to God. It is not of his own choosing. Right? He's got to be within the boundaries. That's really, really important for us to remember. Even as we look at these other things that I'm going to show you that shape Satan can do. Now, although this next verse that we're going to cover, this is addressed to Timothy, and it's speaking of elders in the church. Okay? But it gives us really good insight into seeing why we all have to be fit. Why we have to understand the way things work and be spiritually fit. Because he must, this is talking about an elder, he must not be newly converted so that he does not become prideful and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Pride is the condemnation of the devil. It is a sneaky business within the church. We can all, oh well, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian all the time. Yeah. I don't know what you, you knew, whippersnappers, you're going to try to tell me. <laughs> I'm telling you, it can become an issue no matter who it is, whether it's an elder in the church or, you know, or, or the guy shining the, the, the rails outside. It doesn't make any difference. It is a trap. It is something that we can fall into. It also says, moreover, he must have a good reputation among those who are outsiders so that he does not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. As soon as we become Christians, as soon as that happens, Satan's lost the battle, but he has not lost the war. You know, he intensifies his efforts and changes the direction with which he attacks us. Second Timothy 3 said, 12 says this, Yes, and all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will suffer persecution. Now, it doesn't say might. There's no way, I mean, look at it in the Greek. It doesn't say anything about this. Yeah, there's a slight chance, maybe 10% chance you're not going to. It says you will. Everybody who tries to do this, everybody that tries to do this will suffer persecution. In fact, if we look through God's Word, there's more than 100 verses, more than 100 verses in the New Testament about this very subject. You know, you're going to get persecution from it. And if, in fact, if you don't feel it, you need to check your pulse. Okay? Because something's, something's not right. You don't recognize, and maybe it's just you don't recognize it for what it is. But listen, you're, if you are in Christ, you're going to have persecution. The Bible guarantees us. Our Lord himself tells us that that will happen. Um, we see here that Satan tempts us with pride, and he works overtime to get us to fall into reproach. Now, what does reproach mean? Reproach is having people disapprove of you, or, or they're disappointed in you, and so therefore it damages your testimony. You know, I've said a whole bunch. I've said people who are not Christians, they don't read the Bible, they read Christians. And if we're acting like a bunch of idiots out there, and we're... And we're Suffering reproach, that means that we're damaging our testimony before the very people that need to hear our testimony the most. So we have to be very careful and understand when the attacks of the enemy come, what they are, why they are the way they are, so that we don't damage our testimony. Our testimony is precious. Your testimony is precious. And it can be mightily used of God. 
even him whose coming is in accordance with the working of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders. And we've already talked about God's boundaries and Satan, how he's confined it to them. But we can see in Scripture, that in the story of Job, that Satan used fire from heaven and a mighty wind. Supernatural events. Okay? Supernatural events that he was commanding to try and break Job with those new allowable boundaries that he was given. He used supernatural events to try to break Job. And you know what? We're going to see signs and wonders. We're going to see that take place in the future as, as, as Satan escalates his deception that we find in Matthew chapter 24. Right? It's going to get stronger and stronger as the restraining power, the boundary, that is currently set removed. Okay. We're going to see him being able to do the miraculous. We're going to be able to see him doing signs and wonders. For such are false apostles and deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Now, remember, we're talking about things that Satan can do. These are things that he can do, and he is doing. This is another reason why we have to be spiritually fit. Look, I've often up here quoted the theologian Charles Spurgeon when he said, discernment is not simply a matter of telling the difference between what is right and and what is wrong, rather it is the difference between right and almost right. You cannot do that if you don't know what's right. How can you tell what's right if you don't know what's right? The current state of the church is that everything sounds good. Everything sounds easy. Everything sounds doable. You know, Christian life. Listen, if it's almost right by God's definition, it's all wrong. If it's almost right, it's all wrong. And it's not based on what I think. It's not based on what you think. It's not based on somebody who has a million followers on YouTube. It is not based on somebody who has a church where there's 50,000 people sitting in front of them every single Sunday listening to a motivational speech. Yes. The God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on. If you're in Christ Jesus, Satan can't poke you in your mind's eye. Okay? He can't have it. But he blinds those who are not. He just tries to fool the rest of us. Okay? He can't blind you. However, we always keep in mind what that Paul said about fights not against flesh and blood. Remember, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So our frustration with people outside of the faith needs to be kept in check. We, don't be, we need to not be warring with our enemies. We need to not be showing our anger because something is going on in town that's too loud for you to sleep on a Saturday night. Personal experience. <laughs> okay. I got stuff to do tomorrow. <laughs> so no, that's that's just, we can't do that. We cannot do that. We, we cannot bring that reproach on ourselves. Remember, no disappointment, no no disapproval from the world towards you know our job is to never let that happen. But what happens? Sure, you just stomp your toe. That's all part of the sanctification process. It's going to take place. But our job is to try to keep the tarnish. Off the testimony. Okay. What else? Therefore, listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away. What was or snatches away what was sown in his heart? This is the one who receives seed beside the path. But he who received the seed on rocky ground is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself. But endures for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, eventually he falls away. He also who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. All right, I'm going to give 
one guest this morning to who can snatch away, deliver tribulation and persecution because of the word and tempt you with cares and riches. We know these things. It's that stinky little devil. Right? That's exactly who is behind all of these things that we see. Remember I told you he's won a battle, but he has not won the war? We need to be aware of how he works and how he does his things. How he does his work. Therefore, we wish to come to you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. What? This is Paul speaking. Wait, how is that possible? Listen, as our level of spiritual fitness grows and, and we become more effective in our mission, the hindrances that Satan is allowed to cause will likely increase. How are we going to happen? This is the last thing I mentioned. Remember the Prince of Persia? It took 21 days for Gabriel, the angel, to reach Daniel because he was being hindered by the Prince of Persia. Remember, this is it's not flesh and blood. It's these guys. So the farther and more effective we get in our mission, that's going to take place. They're going to have that happen, right? Satan doesn't like your God-given mission. He does not like it. He hated Paul's God-given mission. Hated it. But did that stop Paul's mission? Well, it was just a minor detour. Just a, a little bit of a left turn. Listen to you. This... Where this verse comes from, we have to understand that what he's talking about here is Satan. He, Satan used the local government to tell Paul he could never, ever, ever set foot in Thessalonica again, or he would be killed. The local government was complicit with the enemy in telling Paul, you can't come back here. So what did Paul do? Paul wrote a couple letters. We still have them. This wasn't, I mean, again, we have to understand God's Purpose. God's final purpose for all of these things that we might see in our life is, oh my goodness, he stopped me from going somewhere that I wanted to go. Because he's got another plan. Paul wrote his letter specifically because he was stopped from going there and talked to them himself. And how many people, how many Christians have learned a great deal about the word of God and the gospel message because of Paul's letters? And because he couldn't go to some of these places. How many? Untold millions. Untold millions have heard that message. So it's, you know, Satan didn't hinder anything. Satan walked right into God's plan. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And so that's what we have to remember for ourselves. If things get tough, something's stop, stopping you from doing what you think you're supposed to do, maybe it's just God wanting you to take a left turn and right away. I don't know. We need to look for it. This is never a defeat. We, we, we have a defeatist attitude because we don't fully understand the big picture. I want you to think about it this way. It's not a defeat. It's a, what am I missing? What am I not seeing? What part of God's big picture am I, is not clear to me right now? Which part of it? What's the new course? Lord, show me the new course. This is a dead end. What I thought was supposed to transpire is not it. Show me the new course. We're going to see a little bit more of that in this next verse. In gentleness, instructing those in opposition, perhaps God will grant them repentance to know the truth, and they may escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. This is people, this is this is people who in the church were in direct opposition to the mission. They were directly in opposition. They were trying to stand in the way. And obviously we understand here that they weren't, you know, they weren't in Christ. They were directly standing in the way. Whatever work God has for you to do, there are going to be naysayers, both inside and outside the church. Okay? It's going to happen. You can bank on it. So where does the opposition actually come from? Where does it come from? It's our enemy at large. We have to always keep that in mind. Notice here how we're supposed to respond. Okay? This is the way a Christian responds to the human element 
that's a part of this with gentleness so that perhaps God will grant them repentance. So you don't catch a lot of flies with vinegar. Okay? It doesn't work. And if you are, if you're trying your very best to turn hard hearts from the world to the Lord Jesus Christ, how does that work when it's everything that comes out of our mouth is condemnation? That is not, that is not the way of the Lord. That is not what he is telling us here. And, how about this one? Unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, lest I be exalted above measure. I want to tell you, the jury's out on what Paul's thorn was. Okay, we, we, we don't know. We're not given that exactly from Scripture. You know, people will say it was from the many injuries that he, you know, sustained from all of the physical abuse that he took. Uh, people will say that it was, it was part of the injury that he suffered when they threw him in the pit and left him for dead, and that he had eye issues he couldn't see. We know that from the, some of the original letters that it talked about him having to write really big letters. So it may have been that, or it may have just have been the persecution itself. He was always tormented at every turn. Persecution just came and came and came. So the Lord may have actually been the persecution itself. Whatever it was, it didn't really matter. It's not important because what it was there for was to keep Paul's pride in check. And here again, we see that Satan meant something for evil. And God used it for good. He used it for Paul's good. Now, you know, I don't know. There, there may be people in the room that have a thorn. Something that you would consider as a thorn. And the question is not, you know, how hard is this to deal with? The question is, why do I have it? Why do I have it? What, what is it that God's trying to show me? What, what is God trying to protect me from by giving me this thorn? It's, it's a question we need to ask. Okay? So, so we've had a, a little bit of a sampling of the things that are in Satan's little bag of dirty tricks. And we need to understand that he has a pretty big arsenal. These are, this is just scratching the surface of some of the things that he can do. But he can't even pull an arrow out of his quiver without God saying it's okay. Without being inside of the boundaries that God has set. And if you think about that in your own life, think about the God has set the boundaries around you. Anything that you are going through are because God is allowing you to change your perspective on what's going on in your life. It makes it look different. So even if God broadens Satan's boundaries and allows other things that are more tragic, more difficult to deal with come into your life, you have to always understand that that's, God's allowed that. God moved the, he moved the marker. And Satan couldn't do it if God would not have moved the marker. Something very, very important to always keep in the back of your mind. Because it's likely that the boundary I've moved is for your edification. And you just haven't seen it from the light of day. Even to unto death, right? Even unto death. Listen, listen to me. This is important. Now, that sounds like a bad deal. But I promise you that if you're in Christ Jesus a half of a nanosecond after you take your last breath, you won't care. You won't care. I promise there will not be a single person in this room that's standing before the Lord. Well, you know what? I want to go back. The cheese was really good. <laughs> be sober and watchful because your adversary, the devil, walks around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, this reminds me of a bully on the playground in the elementary school. Right? And he's looking around, he's like, okay, which one of the kindergartners is weak? Okay. All right? Yeah. Especially if he's in third grade. Or, you know, oh, what first grader can I pinch the lunch money from today? Listen, you see movies and stuff where all of a sudden the small guy sometimes just turns around and smacks the bully right in the nose and causes his nose to bleed. Guess what? It stops the abuse. Does it not? If we know our enemy, and we know how to fight our enemy, and we're fighting back with the power of God and not the power of our own selves. Literally, we can say the bloody nose. He's the bully on the, on the, on the, on the playground, going around looking, okay, who can I get today? 
Which one of the people in there was asleep and wasn't listening to the sermon? Okay, because that's what he does. He's looking for weakness within each and every one of us. God tells us how strong we are. God tells us if we lean on him, there is nothing, nothing that can come against us. He's not going to stop attacking until Jesus puts him there. You have to know your enemy. Listen, we also have to know our advocate. You also know, have to know what Jesus Christ is doing for you right now this morning. He is at the right hand of the Father mediating for you. When you are raising your request to God, Jesus is like, okay, Father, this is what John's saying today. You know, he's having a tough time. That's what's taking place. He's our mediator before, before his Father. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? They said, some say that you are John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Most people have heard this passage. In fact, it's one of the entire church that faces the identity of their leader on this passage. Okay? Name names? Does anyone everybody knows what I'm talking about? Um, listen, listen, most don't understand the imagery. Most don't understand what is taking place here. Peter is not the rock on whom the church is built. All right? That isn't it. That isn't. Peter's confession of who Jesus is is the rock that the church is built on. The confession. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, is the rock the church is built on. That's the gospel. The gospel is built, and the church is built on the gospel. It's built on the gospel message. Let me give you a couple of side notes here. Important. When you're reading this, it says, and I tell you, you are Peter. It's Petros. A little rock. And you get down here and it says, and on this rock is Petra. Petra is not a rock. It's not a little rock. It is a rock face of a cliff. It is huge. It is immense. Okay. One other thing. And you can notice where Jesus is at this particular point when he's talking to his apostles. He's in Caesarea Philippi. Anybody know anything interesting about Caesarea Philippi? There's a, there's a huge cave entrance inside of a massive cliff in, in Caesarea Philippi. It's at the base of Mount Carmel. And it's called the Grotto of Pan. Okay, Pan is a god, little g, little g, of the underworld. And this place was the center of pagan worship in that entire area at the time of Jesus. Pagan worship, and in fact, this grotto was called the Gates of Hades. Do you see the imagery? Ooh. See the imagery here? Jesus stood in the enemy's camp and proclaimed, on this rock, this confession, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall never prevail against it. He was proclaiming to the demonic world, hey, this is what I'm going to do. They didn't catch it. They probably still thought of Peter. They probably didn't understand it. Our advocate was calling them out. The gates of Hades will never prevail against the church. This was Peter's confession. Peter's confession. Is it ours? Is that what we really believe? Is that who we believe our advocate is? What can't Satan do? I mean, we talk, we talk about a number of things that he can do. What can't he do? Well, he can't make you sin. But each man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. Then when, I, then when lust has been conceived, it brings forth sin. When sin is finished, it brings forth death. 
Hey, should I say the same? Satan made me do it. And <laughs> Satan can tempt you to sin, but he can't make you sin. That wins all the money. That's all it is. Satan can't take away God's stamina. No temptation has taken you except what is common to man. God is faithful and he will not permit you to be tempted above what you can endure, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Now you may notice, I didn't say take, Satan can't take away your stamina. I said he can't take away God's stamina. But God tells us right here whose stamina that actually is. It's his, but we have to lean on it. We can't be tempted. We will never be tempted beyond what we can endure. Doesn't mean it won't get difficult. Some of you really know what I'm talking about. It will get difficult at times. Um, finding a way of escape is often what the issue is. Not being able to recognize the way of escape. Okay? Listen, as humans, we want to escape in our own strength. We want to fight all of our own battles. You know, we want to be the ones that are victorious. What does the Bible say is victorious? Jesus is victorious. One of the, one of the things that I think is, is interesting, and, and I'm talking about myself right here, is that often you know, we wait till it, we're in desperation to get down on our knees. God, help me. I'm done. I'm spent. After all of this stuff we went through, that was the actual escape in the first place. That was the area that he gave us to escape to from the very beginning. Listen, there are a ton of promises in God's word about the power of prayer, that it availeth much. The problem is, is that we have to do it. We have to initiate that. That's not something God's going to force down our throat, like, you know, fever medicine when we're a pilot. It's not what the way he works. But it should be the very first thing. The very first thing we do is to fall out there. Satan can't take away your future. The wind can't do it. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish, nor shall anyone snatch them from my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them from my Father's hand. Who's he talking to? Everybody that's warming a chair this morning in this building. If you're in Jesus Christ and you're warming a chair in this church this morning, he is talking about you. You cannot be taken out of the Father's hand. If you're in Christ, you're assured of eternal life in heaven. You can't lose it. You can't lose it. First Peter chapter 2 tells us that once we truly experience the goodness of God, that's it. You're hooked. Biggest thing. Satan can't win. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. I wonder about that last part, but it is what it is. Um, they can't win. But I read the end of the book. Okay? I read the end of the book, and I belong to the one who wrote it. Amen. Everybody? Amen. Since Jesus broke the curse of sin and death, Satan has been defeated. Now, the problem for us is that Satan has a scorched earth policy. He wants to burn down everything on his way out as he will burn. It is only he wants to take your prisoners. That's exactly what he's trying to do. And we need to be aware of who he is so that does not happen to us. That the scorched earth may be there around us, but we don't smell like smoke. <laughs> so we have, we've seen many things this morning that Satan can do, and we've seen many things that he can't do. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says this, Do these things, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Problem is, as much of the church today is ignorant of his devices. It's a very, very important for us to understand that we have to know our enemy. We have to resist our enemy at all costs. Knowledge is wisdom. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your waist girded with truth, 
having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet filled with the readiness of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, with, with which you will be able to extinguish all the fiery arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is a well-known passage. I'm sure everybody in this room this morning has heard this passage. But if you look closely at the verses and what they actually say, the stuff that I've highlighted, you're going to see that all of this armor, lest one piece, is defensive in nature. It's all defensive armor, except for one piece. All the defensive pieces of this armor are attained by the effective use of the one offensive piece. Understand that. All of the pieces that are defensive come from the effective use of the one offensive piece. What is that? Sword and spirit. Sword and spirit. Everybody in this room, everybody in this room should want, if the desire of your heart, should, you would, should want to be a master swordsman if you're not already that. And you don't become a master swordsman unless you practice. Dodging and doing all that good stuff. Right? And let's do it. James 121 says this is received with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. That means, okay, that the word moves from here to here. You own it. It's engrafted into you so that when you see the effect of the enemy. You see the darts of the enemy. You see the attacks of the enemy. You ever got to run into your shelf, pull the Bible down, dust it off, and see if you remember the address of the verse that will tell you how to fight the enemy. That is not what God wants for us. He wants us to be master swordsmen. And listen, I'm telling you, you may not be able, there will be verses that just crazy come to your mind. You won't know the address. It's on you, man. But they're there. Once they're engrafted, they're there for later use. They, they, it happens. It's there. It has to get in there. It has to get in your heart. And that way you can easily recognize the scheme of the enemy. We read that verse that said, that, you know, you're not ignorant of his devices. You're only not ignorant of his devices if the word is engrafted in there. Therefore, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Hopefully, now we can understand a little better how all this works, or how it's supposed to work anyway. Resist the enemy, you have to know the enemy. To know the enemy, you have to know the truth. To know the truth, you have to submit yourselves to the word of God and allow the armor of God to become second nature. Those defensive pieces become second nature as you use the offensive piece, not offensive, but offensive. This is the key to living that righteous life. And next week, I want to talk more about our mission. We okay, said so this would be a three-part series, and we're going to finish it up with talking about our mission. And there's another kind of armor that we also want to talk about you know, when we're finishing up this series. But I want to leave this morning with this uh, a priceless piece of information. A okay? priceless piece of information, taking everything that we've talked about this morning in your account. Whatever takes place in your life, and whatever takes place in those that you love around you, whatever takes place in any part of the brotherhood of Christ Jesus, we have a firm promise that we need to think about what we talked about this morning. We have a firm promise from the sovereign God who sets the boundaries. Because okay, that's what God does. He sets the boundaries. And this is our promise. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Good, bad, or indifferent. The man upstairs is in charge. In charge. 100%. 24-7. 365 plus a week. May not always feel good. Sometimes being a Christian doesn't necessarily feel good. Sometimes it's difficult. But listen, God assures us within his infinite knowledge, his infinite wisdom, and his infinite mercy that all of it 
All of it is for good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.